because I went into my college board account because um to take like the pre SATs uh mm -hmm. for like on April like third I guess around there. And there was like something wrong with my like name, so um. Oh no! Flush the toilet. <laughs> Because in my ID and my birth certificate, there's no hyphen. And then, like, they changed it real quick. And um, I went down to parent. And then I didn't know who that person was. I have no relation or, like, even know that person's Gmail and, like, parent's name info. And it's on my account, and I have no idea who it is. Huh. And it's, like, really strange to me. That's kind of bizarre. Um, yeah. <laughs> If you can, take a screenshot and email it to me and let me take a look. All right. Is that Pablo I see? Yeah. How's it going? Hey, how you doing? Good. Is this your first time on with us? Yeah, I barely saw this. Hey, well, better can late than never. Can you see me? I don't, know, I don't know how to work this. Okay. Well, if you scroll over with your uh, mouse on the bottom, there's a menu that will come up. And okay, yeah. Menu, there's uh, on the left, there's a camera, and there's also a mute. But there, there you are. <laughs> right on. You're like high tech all the way. Yeah. Hey, Leo. Uh, hello. <laughs> it's kind of exciting to see some new faces here. New old faces, I should say. So since we're just at one o'clock, and I know some people are, are connecting on, uh, let's check in. How are people doing? Pretty good. That was the most mellow, good. pretty good I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's well and families are good? Yeah, we good. Glad to hear it. Yeah, we're all home. My dad and my mom got off work. Yeah. They're, they're not working. They said we're all staying home for now. Yeah, well, better safe than sorry, right? Right. So I've been noticing that in the media, you know, um, a lot of people are not used to being home with the people that they call family. And so it's kind of like, uh, all right, I guess we're going to have to renegotiate uh, how we get along and who gets to eat yeah. first and all this kind of fun stuff. <laughs> it's cool. it's different. It's, you got to get used to it. But I feel like it's also important to be like a long time as well. Like get a, go to, like, to your room for a little bit and chill and then go back with them. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's good to have a balance. A little bit. Hey, I got a question for you guys. What's everybody doing for exercise? Uh, I'm still active. I got like my animals and stuff, so I got I'm doing that every day. Okay. That's moving around, like moving things around and got me working a little bit. And taking walks, the dock, dock walks on the riverbed. I I live right by the riverbed. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm sad. The gyms are closed. Yeah. Yeah. Um so I got a great, you remember that guy that I went to go visit in Utah? And actually, I still need to post that blog post about my visit with the, uh, the fighter bodybuilder guy. I wanna yeah, I want to see that. that. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll, put, I'll put that up. But he sent me uh, a workout that doesn't require any equipment. And I do a three-mile trail run every day, but I've been adding this, and it's knocking me on my butt. I don't even have to leave my room. But if you guys think that's helpful, I'll post it for everybody. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I'll share it. He actually said that he'd be willing to come on Zoom with us too, so maybe I'll get him on one one of these days. Yeah, that's cool. All right. So did everybody find the uh the book that I posted online? Yes. Yeah? Nice. Great. Lena, I see you nodding. Hi Deanna. Hi. Um, okay. So has everybody read up to about where we are? Because I know that we have every day we might have a slightly different group and I don't want to repeat so much that people get bored, but I also want to make sure that if you're just joining us for the first time, you kind of know what's happening. So where would you guys like me to pick up and, and what would you like to see happen today? Um, I've barely, it's my first time on, but I already read it last year. I remember some parts, so. Okay, well. You ain't never studied it like you're going to study it with me. Yeah, so I remember, I remember some parts, though. Um, did you see the um, the stuff that I put up on the blog about uh, Ray Bradbury? No, not really. I just saw this. Okay. Well, the dude tried to date my grandmother in high school. Oh. 
<laughs> in, in like the 1930s. That's almost 100 years ago. That's, that's, that's been a while. I'm glad he wasn't persuasive because otherwise I wouldn't exist. <laughs> so, all right, let's start with where we left off with the text. And then what I'm going to do is leave the last few minutes. If you noticed yesterday on the blog, I posted, oh, and by the way, also Pablo and anybody else who wasn't here, the recordings of our other meetings are on the blog. So you can look at those if you like. Um, I'm going to do our agendas a little bit differently. Most of the time when we meet in person, I'll put up the agenda the night before or early that morning. And what I realized was I was getting so many great ideas from our conversations and we don't really have to worry about which hour we're at school that I'm going to go ahead and do this meeting first. And then while things are fresh for me, I'm going to post the agenda and ideas afterward because I need to post the recording anyway. So it kind of makes sense. And so the first online recording, say online recording one, two, and three. But from now on, I'm just going to do the same that I usually do with the date, except that the first thing you'll see is the recording. Does that work for everybody? Yeah. Cool. All right. And I see Michael's using the chat. Feel free if you have any ideas that you want to share with uh, the group or with an individual, uh, you can use the chat. And if you take a look at that, you can either chat to everyone, like I'm about to do right now, or you can just send a message to one person. So let's see. I'm going to, if you get a text from me, then say so. Okay, I got a reply in chat. Emma, are you feeling shy or is your microphone muted? It's muted. It's because sometimes my, I have a bunch of little siblings and they scream, so. Oh, yeah. thank you for that. I have it off. Okay. Good. Well, I also wanted to use that moment to share with people that you can mute your microphone for exactly that reason. Um, last question before I start reading. How many other teachers are having these kinds of meetings or sharing work with you to do? What's your, what's your workload like right now? Uh, you're my only teacher that's doing this. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Does anybody else have a teacher who's on? I will yeah. later for auto shop for my parents and myself at three. Right on. Is that th uh, with Mr. Almaguer? Yeah. Very cool. How's he doing that online? He did it doing on this. Same on Zoom? Thing. Yeah. Oh, cool. Right he on. Said to it, have both the parents so it could tell us how to tell teach them how to make us do work as well. That's awesome. And yeah. if you remember last time I said to everybody who was here with us, if any one of your parents or siblings, uh, assuming they're over the age of five and, and can sit with us and want to, uh, anybody's invited. It, this is open. So with all that being said, we're going to pick up where we left off. And anybody want to recap what we talked about yesterday? What was happening to Mildred yesterday? First of all, who is Mildred? I believe Mildred is a wife to Montag. Exactly. And... The first character that we met was Montag, and then we met Clarice, the 17-year-old girl that uh, struck up a conversation with him. How would you describe Montag's and Mildred's marriage? Are these loving, happy people who go have picnics and spend time and laugh together? They sleep in separate beds, and like he says it's cold whenever he enters the room, and that it's just like, it's just like really unhappy. Yeah. It's really, it's really lonely. What's that? I think that was Michael, but I couldn't hear. Uh, they live really lonely, like they like to separate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, seems, it seems really cold and depressing. And if you remember, Mildred tried to kill herself. She over, well, maybe we don't know if why she did it, but she overdosed on sleeping pills. So the first scene that we see her, she's laying in the dark. Montag flicks on his lighter to see if he can see her, and her eyes are wide open staring at him, which freaked him out. And then he calls these medical professionals but they're more like mechanics. And one of them is even smoking a cigarette. And we talked about how Ray Bradbury way back when, because when he wrote this, things weren't like that. When he wrote this, there were doctors who knew you and would come to your house. So they've just left. Montag got up and he went to the kitchen because Mildred was no longer there. So now he's in the kitchen and he finds Mildred. Toast popped out of the silver toaster was seized by a spidery metal hand that drenched it with melted butter. Mildred watched the toast delivered to her plate. She had both ears plugged with electronic bees that were humming the hour away. 
What were the electronic bees that he's talking about? What does that metaphor Earphone. refer to? Is it like like headphones? But since exactly. it's like then they didn't really have. Oh, yeah, did they have right. that back then? No, they didn't. And we talked about how Ray Bradbury predicted all this stuff. Yeah, it's pretty scary because like he does that like a lot. Like it looks like he's talking about something that happened like the seven, like something as close as like the seventies. Totally. And a lot of these things for us now, they're not unusual. But back when he wrote this, it was total science fiction weirdoville because nobody had that stuff. Nobody had even imagined it. She looked up suddenly, saw him, and nodded. You all right? He asked. She was an expert at lip reading from 10 years of apprenticeship at Seashell Ear Thimbles. She nodded again. She set the toaster clicking away at another piece of bread. Montag sat down. His wife said, I don't know why I should be so hungry. You, I'm hungry. Last night, he began. Didn't sleep well. Feel terrible, she said. God, I'm hungry. I can't figure it. Last night, he said again. She watched his lips casually. What about last night? Don't you remember? What, did we have a wild party or something? Feel like I have a hangover. God, I'm hungry. Who was here? A few people. She thinks he's talking about guests. He's obviously talking about the mechanics who pumped her stomach. That's what I thought. She chewed her toast. Sore stomach, but I'm hungry as all get out. Hope I didn't do anything foolish at the party. No, he said quietly. The toaster spidered out a piece of buttered bread for him. He held it in his hand, feeling obligated. You don't look so hot yourself, said his wife. In the late afternoon, it rained, and the entire world was dark gray. He stood in the hall of his house, putting on his badge with the orange salamander burning across it. He stood looking up at the air conditioning vent in the hall for a long time. His wife in the TV parlor paused long enough from reading her script to glance up. Hey, she said, the man's thinking. She's kind of making fun of him. Yes, he said, I wanted to talk to you. He paused. You took all the pills in your bottle last night. Oh, I wouldn't do that, she said, surprised. The bottle was empty. I wouldn't do a thing like that. Why would I do a thing like that, she said. Maybe you took two pills and forgot, and took two more, and forgot again, and took two more, and were so dopey you kept right on until you had 30 or 40 of them in you. Heck, she said. What would I want to go and do a silly thing like that for? I don't know, he said. She was quite obviously waiting for him to go. I didn't do that, she said, never in a billion years. So that raises a couple questions. When we first find out that she did this, the mechanics who came to pump her stomach said that this happens all the time. And we talked about the fact that maybe the author is giving a signal that the society that they live in isn't very happy and people are miserable. But what do you do when you have clear evidence of something and you confront someone and they totally deny it? How do you handle a moment like that? Anybody have any ideas? I mean, sometimes it could be like that the people just like don't want to talk about like what they went through maybe. And like, they don't want to accept the fact that it happened. So they just deny it, but like they're really just denying it to themselves. Uh, that's really compassionate of you. So really what you're saying, Elva, is that it's not so much that she's trying to be dishonest. It's just that she can't quite process it in her own mind. Yeah, like maybe, she like wanted to end things like the night before, but like things didn't go as planned. Like she may be embarrassed about it. Okay. All right. We'll hold that as a possibility. That's a kind way to look at it. I appreciate you saying so. All right. If you say so, he said, that's what the lady said. She turned back to her script. What's on this afternoon? He asked tiredly. She didn't look up from the script again. Well, this is a play comes on the wall to wall circuit in 10 minutes. They mailed me my part this morning. I sent in some box tops. They write the script with one part missing. It's a new idea. The homemaker, that's me, is the missing part. When it comes time for the missing lines, they all look at me out of the three walls and I say the lines. Here, for instance, the man says, what do you think of this whole idea, Helen? And he looks at me sitting here center stage, see? And I say, I say, she paused and ran her finger under a line on the script. I think that's fine. And then they go on with the play until he says, do you agree to that, Helen? And I say, 
I sure do. Isn't that fun, guy? He stood in the hall looking at her. It's sure fun, she said. What's the play about? I told you. There are these people named Bob and Ruth and Helen. Oh, now you remember all the times when we were talking about The Great Gatsby and I said, when someone asks you, what is this about? That's a question that really wonders about the theme, right? The central message. And if you're in fourth grade, you just tell them what happens. What do you think of Mildred's intelligence level here? Fourth grade level. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot going on. And the show yeah. itself, I have no idea what to say about that because we don't get any information. It's really fun. It'll be even more fun when we can afford to have the fourth wall installed. How long you figure before we save up and get the fourth wall torn out and a fourth wall TV put in? It's only $2,000. That's one third of my yearly pay. It's only $2,000, she replied. And I should think you'd consider me sometimes. If we had a fourth wall, why it'd be just like this room wasn't ours at all, but all kinds of exotic people's rooms. We could do without a few things. So she's all about herself, right? And here's, so here's something I can't do normally. So I'm gonna turn this around so you can see the room. This is my living room. And that big black ugly thing over the fireplace is a what? TV. Yeah. TV. It's a TV. But back when he wrote this book, Ray Bradbury didn't have TVs like that. So again, this is science fiction. The TVs that he was imagining are entire walls of screens. Anybody have one of those old box television sets? I, I remember what they look like. It's a big yeah, it's almost like an antique conversation now, right? <laughs> oh, wait, Dr. Preston. Yeah. I know, like, I said all those things about, like, Mildred before, but, like, like since we kind of know more about her character and, like, we're getting to, like, see what she's like, Yeah. like, it doesn't seem like something, I don't know, it's just, like, like, different now, like, I feel, well, I feel confused about it because, like, I think I made her just seem more complex than she really is. I think you started in a very, very positive, wonderful, human way that I wish more people could in our society, which is you gave her the benefit of the doubt. And now that you're getting more information, what I'm hearing is maybe you're thinking, huh, maybe there's more to this than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you might be right. And by the end of the book, uh, I'll ask you again. How about that? <laughs> so she says, is that all it was? She sat looking at him for a long moment. Well, goodbye, dear. Goodbye, he said. He stopped and turned around. Does it have a happy ending? I haven't read that far. He walked over, read the last page, nodded, folded the script, and handed it back to her. He walked out of the house into the rain. The rain was thinning away and the girl was walking in the center of the sidewalk with her head up and the few drops falling on her face. She smiled when she saw Montag. Hello. He said hello and then said, what are you up to now? I'm still crazy. The rain feels good. I love to walk in it. Oh, if you haven't yet read or if you're joining us for the first time, Clarice's uncle was Leonard Mead from The Pedestrian. Only it's never mentioned in the book. It only says that her uncle was arrested once for being a pedestrian. But Ray Bradbury based part of this story on it. And the reason that's important for us is that Clarice really thinks and feels and communicates. Montag feels like she listens. His wife and most of the people around don't seem to share that in common. The rain feels good. I love to walk in it. I don't think I'd like that, he said. You might if you tried. I never have. She licked her lips. Rain even tastes good. What do you do? Go around trying everything once? He asked. Sometimes twice. She looked at something in her hand. What have you got there? He said. I guess it's the last of the dandelions this year. I didn't think I'd find one on the lawn this late. Have you ever heard of it rubbing under your chin? Look, she touched her chin with the flower laughing. Why? If it rubs off, it means I'm in love. Has it? He could hardly do anything else but look. Well, she said, you're yellow under there. Fine, let's try you now. It won't work for me. Here, before he could move, she had put the dandelion under his chin. He drew back and she laughed. Hold still. 
She peered under his chin and frowned. Well, he said. What a shame, she said. You're not in love with anyone. Yes, I am. It doesn't show. I am very much in love. He tried to conjure up a face to fit the words, but there was no face. I am. Oh, please don't look that way. It's that dandelion, he said. You used it all up on yourself. That's why it won't work for me. Of course, that must be it. Oh, now I've upset you. I can see I have. I'm sorry. I really, I am. She touched his elbow. No, no, he said quickly. I'm all right. I've got to be going. So say you forgive me. I don't want you angry with me. I'm not angry. Upset? Yes. I've got to go see my psychiatrist now. They make me go. I make up things to say. I don't know what he thinks of me. He says I'm a regular onion. I keep him busy peeling away the layers. I'm inclined to believe you need the psychiatrist, said Montag. You don't mean that. He took a breath and let it out and at last said, no, I don't mean that. The psychiatrist wants to know why I go out and hike around in the forests and watch the birds and collect butterflies. I'll show you my collection someday. Good. They want to know what I do with all my time. I tell them that sometimes I just sit and think, but I won't tell them what. I've got them running. And sometimes I tell them, I like to put my head back like this and let the rain fall in my mouth. It tastes just like wine. Have you ever tried it? No, I, you have forgiven me, haven't you? Yes, he thought about it. Yes, I have. God knows why. You're peculiar, you're aggravating. Yet you're easy to forgive. You say you're 17? Well, next month. How odd, how strange. And my wife, 30, and yet you seem so much older at times. I can't get over it. You're peculiar yourself, Mr. Montag. Sometimes I even forget you're a fireman. Now, may I make you angry again? Go ahead. How did it start? How did you get into it? How did you pick your work and how did you happen to think to take the job you had? You're not like the others. I've seen a few, I know. When I talk, you look at me. When I said something about the moon, you looked at the moon. The others would never do that. The others would walk off and leave me talking or threaten me. No one has time anymore for anyone else. You're one of the few who put up with me. That's why I think it's so strange you're a fireman. It just doesn't seem right for you somehow. And let's remember the fireman in this book is a person who goes and sets fire to people's homes to burn their books. He felt his body divide itself into a hotness and a coldness, a softness and a hardness, a trembling and a not trembling, the two halves grinding one upon the other. You'd better run on to your appointment, he said. And she ran off and left him standing there in the rain. Only after a long time did he move. And then, very slowly as he walked, he tilted his head back in the rain for just a few moments and opened his mouth. So he's really listening to this person. Now, all of that was dialogue, right? First it was dialogue with Mildred and Montag, and then it was dialogue with Clarice and Montag. What was the author doing with all of that talking? What did he accomplish by sharing all of those ideas in the conversations that they were having? I feel like you get to see how like how different it is like when he has a conversation with someone like Mildred compared to someone like Clarice and like how more thoughtful one is and like just like you could just like really see the difference in the talking. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Can I, sorry, can I go real quick? I, yeah. I kind of agree with like what Elva like was saying, like too, like mm-hmm. with the dialogue, you can kind of like contrast between like the society he's trying to depict of like these people becoming robots and stuff between like Clarice or like, where is humanity kind of going? Mm-hmm. I agree. Anybody else? So in giving us kind of ideas, windows really into their personalities, What we just read is a lot of indirect characterization, huh? So I want to mark that because when we talk about the literary techniques, um, and this is important for both classes, for American Lit and for AP, this is a technique that writers use that helps avoid a paragraph that sounds like she's 17, people think she's crazy, she goes to a psychiatrist, and giving us a long laundry list of direct description which would serve the same purpose. We would come away understanding her, but this is way more interesting. Now we shift scenes. Now we're going away from their conversation and Montag is going to the firehouse where he works. But first, the mechanical hound slept but did not sleep, lived but did not live in its gently humming, 
gently vibrating, softly illuminated kennel back in a dark corner of the firehouse. The dim light of one in the morning, the moonlight from the open sky framed through the great window, touched here and there on the brass and the copper and the steel of the faintly trembling beast. Light flickered on bits of ruby glass and on sensitive capillary hairs in the nylon brushed nostrils of the creature that quivered gently, gently, its eight legs spidered under it on rubber padded paws. Eight legs? Why does it say it slept but did not sleep? The mechanical hound slept but did not sleep. What does that mean? When your computer sleeps, is it really sleeping? No. No, no. It's, still, it's a thing, right? So this is a robot dog with eight legs. Remember in Toy Story, the weird slapped together toys in the original, that baby with the spider legs? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's messed up, isn't it? I mean, it sounds funny, but that's creepy. Yeah. Oh, and he this was the nice one. <laughs> yeah. He was like the sweet one, and it was like oh, the yeah. pretty one that was the mean one. <laughs> That's right. Uh, this thing is not nice at all. <laughs> Montag slid down the brass pole. He went out to look at the city, and the clouds had cleared away completely. And he lit a cigarette and came back to bend down and look at the hound. It was like a great bee come home from some field where the honey is full of poison wildness, of insanity and nightmare, its body crammed with that overrich nectar, and now it was sleeping the evil out of itself. And by the way, I told you about the art in this book, my copy. Oh, wow. What's that? Is that supposed to be the mechanical hound? Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll take pictures so that you can see this more clearly, and I'll put them up on the blog. Wow. Most of the copies of this book are not illustrated, but this is a special edition, and so I'll get treated to a surprise every other few pages. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Preston, is your video on? Because I don't see anything. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Uh, can everybody else see me? Yeah. 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 It's part okay. of the thing. Um, Lily, I'm wondering. Yeah, I don't know. Huh. Well, it's probably because I'm not connected to my Wi-Fi. I'm at Walmart. I was wondering about that ceiling. I was thinking, wow, that's a tall garage you've got there. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, well, I forgot I had the Zoom conference. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, you had... I, see I see it. Okay, great. Hello, whispered Montag, fascinated as always with the dead beast, the living beast. Nights when things got dull, which was every night, the men slid down the brass pole and set the ticking combinations of the olfactory system of the hound. Does anybody know what your olfactory sense is? You got five senses, take a guess. Uh, <laughs> feel, no. No, so now you got four left to choose from. Would it be the smell? The nose? Yes, smell. That's right. Oh, why is that? Okay. Oh, you did? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. So they set the combinations of the smell for the hound, and they let loose rats in the firehouse areaway, and sometimes chickens, and sometimes cats that would have to be drowned anyway. And there would be betting to see which of the cats or chickens or rats the hound would seize first. The animals were turned loose. Three seconds later, the game was done the rat, cat, or chicken, caught half across the areaway, gripped in gentling paws, while a four-inch hollow steel needle plunged down from the proboscis, right, of the hound to inject massive jolts of morphine or procaine. The pawn was then tossed in the incinerator. A new game began. So the hound is a killer. Montag stayed upstairs most nights when this went on. There had been a time two years ago when he had bet with the best of them and lost a week's salary and faced Mildred's insane anger, which showed itself in veins and blotches. So Ella, there's a little bit more of a window into Mildred, right? Yeah. But now, nights he lay in his bunk, face turned to the wall, listening to the whoops of laughter below and the piano string scurry of rat feet, the violin squeaking of mice and the great shadowing motion silence of the hound leaping out like a moth in the raw light finding, holding its victim, inserting needle and going back to its kennel to die as if a switch had been turned. Montag touched the muzzle. The hound growled. Montag jumped back. 
The hound half rose in its kennel and looked at him with green-blue neon light flickering in its suddenly activated eye bulbs. It growled again, a strange rasping combination of electrical sizzle, a frying sound, a scraping of metal, a turning of cogs that seemed rusty and ancient with suspicion. No, no, boy, said Montag, his heart pounding. He saw the silver needle extend upon the air an inch, pull back, extend, pull back. The growl simmered in the beast and it looked at him. Montag backed up. The hound took a step from its kennel. Montag grabbed the brass pole with one hand. The pole, reacting, slid upward and took him with it through the ceiling quietly. He stepped off in the half-lit deck of the upper level. He was trembling and his face was green-white. Below, the hound had sunk back down upon its eight incredible insect legs and was humming to itself again its multifaceted eyes at peace. Montag stood, letting the fears pass by the drop hole. Behind him, four men at a card table under a green lidded light in the corner glanced briefly but said nothing. Only the man with the captain's hat and the sign of the phoenix on his hat, at last, curious, his playing cards in his thin hand, talked across the long room. Montag? It doesn't like me, said Montag. What, the hound? The captain studied his cards, come off it. It doesn't like or dislike, it just functions. It's like a lesson in ballistics. It has a trajectory we decide on for it. It follows through. It targets itself, homes itself, and cuts off. It's only copper wire, storage batteries, and electricity. Montag swallowed. Its calculators can be set to any combination. So many amino acids, so much sulfur, so much butterfat and alkaline, right? We all know that. All of those chemical balances and percentages on all of us here in the house are recorded in the master file downstairs. It would be easy for someone to set up a partial combination on the hound's memory, a touch of amino acids perhaps. That would account for what the animal did just now, reacted toward me. Hell, said the captain. Irritated, but not completely angry. Just enough memory set up in it by someone so it growled when I touched it. Who would do a thing like that, asked the captain. You haven't any enemies here, guy. None that I know of. We'll have the hound checked by our technicians tomorrow. This isn't the first time it's threatened me, said Montag. Last month it happened twice. We'll fix it up, don't worry. But Montag did not move and only stood thinking of the ventilator grill in the hall at home and what lay hidden behind the grill. If someone here in the firehouse knew about the ventilator, then mightn't they tell the hound? The captain came over to the drop hole and gave Montag a questioning glance. Now, that's where I'm going to leave it for today. But what does that tell you about Montag and the other firemen? How does Montag feel about working with the other firemen? He's like untrusting of them. Yeah. First of all, they, they seem like a very cruel group of people that they're just going to set animals around and watch a robot kill them, right? Yeah. So... What does that tell you about Montag, that he doesn't want to participate with that? He's a kind-hearted person. Well said, he Lena. Sets fire, but doesn't he, like, set fires? Yeah. But I feel like he yeah. does that, like, he doesn't want to, though. Okay. Yeah, his personality doesn't seem to go with his job. That's what's confusing yeah. to Clarice. Remember how Clarice says, you're not like the others? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting a clearer sense now. Now, we got a little bit of foreshadowing here. Montag's hiding something at home that he doesn't want anyone to see. You know, let's see if I can find a ventilator grill to show you. You see up in the ceiling there? Yeah. That little grill for the vent for the air conditioner? Oh, yeah. That's the kind of space that he's talking about. You don't put stuff there unless you want to hide it. So now we know that Montag's got literally got something to hide. And we're going to find out about how this creates tension in the plot. Does anybody have any comments or questions about what we read today? Oh, like when I first heard that he's like a fireman that sets fires, it just reminded me of like this one episode, I I, like Criminal Minds, <laughs> um, where like the guy would like set fires, but just to make himself seem like a, like a, like a, like a hero afterwards. Mm. Yeah. And I don't know, it's just like, I got my yeah. <laughs> It's a little random, but it's still. 
Yeah. Do you remember last semester I introduced a phrase and I'm going to type it into the chat. Um, cognitive dissonance. Does anyone remember that? I kind of remember. Does anyone remember, remember what it means? No. <laughs> I'm going to try this because I haven't really played around with Zoom too much, but I think I can put a link in here. Um, so cognitive dissonance is when you have two ideas that don't go together. Kind of like um, if somebody says, you know what, I'm really super hungry. So let's go to a restaurant and not eat. Those ideas don't go together at all, right? No. But it makes you sit up and pay attention and think, like, why would you say that? So when you have a fireman, ha ha, it does work. So I put in a link to cognitive dissonance in the chat. But when you have an idea like that, it makes people go, huh? And pay a little bit different kind of attention. So in a way, the author is starting to make us, like, wonder the why questions. Why is Montag the way he is? Clarice even asked in the question, how did you get this job? And I'm hoping, well, actually I kind of know, but I'm hoping for you guys that you get Montag's answer for that because it's powerful. And it also has to do with how we choose what we do. Um, speaking of which, there are a lot of people who aren't here today. Uh, and I've been all over people's blogs and I'm starting to make comments, which I don't normally do, but in these times, I really want people to see that I'm on your blogs and I'm looking at them. So, if you know somebody in class who's not able to make it, um, you might want to reach out and send them a link of today's recording. I'll have that up within the hour. If you need anything or want anything from me between now and tomorrow, you know where to find me. Um, before we close out today, uh, does anybody have any uh, parting last words? No. No. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, no. I, guess, I guess no is a word, so that's good. <laughs> thanks for the for the text pablo i got your no in writing um so i'll go ahead and i'll put up um i'm still going to do what i normally do when we meet together so i'm going to put up uh, a thought that you might use for your moment of mindfulness if anybody's doing that and i strongly encourage it with all the stress and everything else we got going on uh, i'll put up a journal topic and i'll put up this recording and a recap and a suggestion for a post and if anybody has any suggestions for that or anything else at all as always, I'm wide open. So, any last words? No. All right. <laughs> Stay safe at Walmart, no. Lily. Keep everybody at a six oh, foot thank distance. You. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Until tomorrow, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Bye.